Welcome everyone. My name is Amherst Williams. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations and I want to thank you for joining us today for another colleague circle. Today um, we are really pleased to be talking about a topic that I think has been on everyone's minds for all of 2020 and long before um, the suffrage centennial. And um, of course 2020 has been a year that has not really gone the way that we all expected that it would. Um, so I'm really pleased that we're able to, before 2020 is over, um, give this topic a bit more attention um, and talk a bit both about um, some of the things that have been going on already at the state, local, and national levels around commemorating the suffrage centennial um, and getting more uh, women's history sort of incorporated into the stories that we tell at our sites, but also looking ahead to think a little bit about how we can carry that work forward. So, you know, I think Often this can be the case with uh, with commemorations is you have this moment where everyone's all of a sudden interested, um, but we don't want to let that enthusiasm dissipate. So um, I'm hopeful that one of the things that we can think about together today as a group um, is how to carry this work forward um, at our sites, in our research, in our interpretation, um, in our public programs, um, and make sure that uh, that women's history continues to get the attention that it deserves. I'm so pleased to welcome with us today to kind of kickstart our conversation, Marsha Weinstein, who's the president of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites, um, which runs the, uh, the Women's History Trail. Um, and she'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, and also Joni DiMartino, uh, who is a CLHO board member um, and at the Prudence Crandall Museum. And she's also been involved with the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. Um, there are a lot of names and a lot of organizations involved with this, so apologies if I messed any of those up. Um, but to kick things off, um, I'm just going to hand things over to Marsha and uh, let her give you a little sense of what, uh, what her organization has been working on. Marsha? Oh, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here today. It's my favorite topic and my total passion. Uh, yeah, I am the president of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. And our mission is to uh, interpret sites to include the contributions of women. As you probably know, since you're related to uh, historic sites and museums, is most people learn their history, not from reading books, but by visiting museums, uh, historic homes, battlefields, and that. And unfortunately, too many times, those sites do not interpret what all the people at that site were doing, even battlefields, the women were there. So our goal is to include in these sites the contributions of women. So uh, we, as we were preparing for the centennial, we came up with the idea to create a national votes for women's trail. And this was simply going to be a database. And we wouldn't try to get states to include on this database, you can go to our website and there's a, a site entry form and you can just enter your site into it. And our goal was to get 2020 sites into our database by the end of December 31st, 2020. So we're at 1700 sites and we really would like Connecticut. And I hope I'm gonna inspire you today to go out and, and and post your site on uh, more than one potentially onto the National Votes for Women's Trail. Well, as we started this project, uh, Colleen Jenkins, who is a daughter of Connecticut, for those that you do not know Colleen, she is the great, great granddaughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she, uh, and she lives in Greenwich, Connecticut. And she is a, a superb connector. Her, Elizabeth Cady Stanton would be very, very proud of Colleen because she lives no stone unturned in, <laughs> in her efforts to uh, educate the American public on the rich history of the suffrage movement. So Colleen was familiar when we were getting this Votes for Women's Trail off the ground, and she knew a woman named Paula Miller that's the executive director of the um, Pomeroy Foundation. And what the Pomeroy Foundation does is that they give free markers, roadside markers to organizations. And so they were very eager to partner with the National Votes for Women's Trail and said that each state, they would give up to at least five roadside markers to um, put up in their state. Since then, they've been, this has been so successful, they have lifted that uh, cap and you can put up as many markers uh, as, 
you have the resources to apply for. But before I go more about the Votes for Women's Trail, Kentucky Educational Television, our PBS station, did about a seven minute video of the Kentucky Votes for Women's Trail. And I thought it would be interesting for you to watch it and get inspired to see what Connecticut can also have. So if you'll show the video. It's been just 100 years since American women won the right to vote. Suffragists achieved those equal rights in the voting booth. Several women from Kentucky were leading figures in the suffrage movement, and markers along a new national trail will tell their stories. What we are learning is the story of how thousands of women and men across America worked on the suffrage movement, and it's never been documented. You cannot find this history anywhere. We have created a national Votes for Women's Trail, and the purpose of this trail is to document the suffrage sites across America where the suffrage movement took place, and we have put it in a database on our computer so anyone can go access it. And it is so exciting. We have over a thousand suffrage sites on our database and we're, our goal is to have over 2020 by 2020. The National Votes for Women's Trail is having a much larger impact than I ever dreamed possible. Because I was the president of the organization, it was kind of like a pilot project. Kentucky's been the first state to get the Pomeroy markers. We got the first one for Susan Look Avery, who was the founder of the Louisville Suffrage Association and also the founder, founder of the Women's Club of Louisville. We had the second one for Dr. Mary Britton, who is an African-American physician from Lexington, the only woman physician in Lexington. And she spoke in Danville at the St. James African um, American Episcopal Church in 1887 uh, to the Kentucky Colored Teachers Association on why women should have the right to vote. And she was also really good friends with Ida B. Wells. Well, this church, which was built in 1884, was thrilled to know this history because they didn't know anything about Dr. Mary Britton there. And they just really appreciated that people cared. I mean, they treated me like I was giving them a million dollars. I'm telling you, they're that happy that this contributions of this woman at their, their site, their church, was being recognized and people cared about. I guess I was so excited and I told my wife and I said I can't, you know, wait to let the people know at church what's going on that, that, about this history. Just to know that this young lady, a black African American, came and spoke on behalf of a women's suffrage uh, in that time era really blew my mind. Because back then, you know, a, a, a woman, especially a woman of color, was supposed to be quiet. But she, with wisdom, spoke. Then we put one up in Richmond, Kentucky, in Whitehall, for Mary Bar Clay. Mary Bar Clay was the oldest daughter of Cassius Clay, and she was brilliant. In 1884, she testified before the U.S. House Judiciary Committee on why women should have the right to vote. I think she was the first woman ever to be allowed to testify before Congress. And she was also president of the some of the national suffrage associations. She brought Susan B. Anthony uh, to Kentucky and other great leaders. So Kentucky was really a strong suffrage state for, you know, considering the South. And then we had this one for Josephine Henry, and then the next one's gonna be for Madeline Breckenridge, who um, was from Lexington. I feel a tremendous energy here in Kentucky. You've taken a lead in putting these roadside markers up. You're honoring a woman that, although she was a, a local figure, she also served as a national figure. And so it's an honor for me to come here and celebrate Josephine Henry, but also the fact that she was involved with the women's suffrage movement. She was involved with Kentucky's Marital Women and Property Act. And she was involved with the women's Bible. So although she lived in this house right here, it's amazing. I get goosebumps to think that how she connected with my great-great-grandmother, who uh, is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Sing it with the spirit that will help the cause along. Sing it as we ought to sing it. 
So to be in the power of a sight, being in the front yard of Josephine Henry's home and feeling her presence and the threshold of her walking in out the door, it's a very spiritual experience that, that she was a real person living in rural Kentucky and making a national impact. We have state coordinators in every state, and their job is to learn and document their history, and that's how it uh, is, is working. It's so all the state coordinators are part of our national network of learning this history. The impact we're having on doing this research is adding to the body of knowledge of American history that's never been, been done before. You know, we know who, you know, Washington, the presidents and the great generals, but we don't know about this contribution that really added 50% of the population to be full citizens. That is huge. And it's relevant today. It's like, oh, who cares what happened, you know, a long time ago. Well, this is really huge in the whole issue of current voting rights. The right to vote is the right which you gain all other rights, or you lose all other rights. Well, my hope is that when people learn this uh, history, that they'll be inspired to be actively engaged in their communities at whatever level that they uh, you know, feel comfortable with, and that they will want to learn more and motivate them to learn more and make them you know, really value voting rights and the importance and understand why it's up to everyone to be engaged. You just can't depend on other people to take care of you. It's your responsibility. Equal rights, our motto is we're loyal to the end, giving the balance to the lady. The suffrage women, they had a really good time. This was not like, oh no, we have to write another book. They had fun. And, I, and so we're having fun. We're gonna have a good time. You know, let the good times roll. How can we stir it up? <laughs> what else can we stir up? Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And the thing that's so wonderful, and I'm going to be honest with you, getting these markers is a lot of hard work. It isn't easy because we have very high standards that everything has to be historically accurate. But when we have these dedication ceremonies, I was just shocked at how much fun it was. And I've learned a new concept, and I know y'all are historians, or, so you know this more than I did, is the, the idea of community history. And that is actually why Mr. Pomeroy started this foundation to give roadside markers to people. It's because as a small child, he and his father would drive around looking for roadside markers. So he learned the value of community history at a young age, and that is what we're doing. And, you know, truly, another thing that I never expected of this project, that we are truly adding to the body of knowledge, knowledge history that has never been told or has been so long ago I forgot about. And the other thing I'm really proud of is the ethnic diversity we have included. 25% of these markers are recognizing uh, women of color, uh, Hispanics, Asians, uh, Native Americans. And so that is a really another very important contribution we're making. So I just can't get you excited enough to tell you that this um, is really of national uh, significance. And in terms of the whole issue, we wanted to have you know, 250 markers installed by the December 31st. Well, that is not to be. But the good thing is, this is takes so long to do, is we're looking at August 26, 2020 is just the kickoff to the 100th anniversary. So it's going to go to August 26, 2021. So we bought some time to still do this project and continue on. And the Pomeroy Foundation has been extremely supportive. And we've been getting a lot of national publicity uh, and newspapers like to you know write about this because you know the fact of the matter, voting issues are hot right now. And most people don't know um, what, you know, how much trouble it went. As a matter of fact, I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. And so of course I wanted Alabama to have roadside markers. And so I spoke to the woman that's in charge of the historic um, Huntsville Foundation about applying for a marker. This has been a few months ago. Well, she got it's applied for a marker, and then she has gotten Alabama markers, and she's discovered black suffrage leaders in Huntsville, Alabama. Now that's pretty important. She, that 
this history hasn't been written about these women and their contributions. So it, it, I can't explain to you that this is truly an exciting, important endeavor, and you will really have a, a lot of fun. Um, uh, is I don't know if I should stop and ask if there's any questions. Um, well, uh, sure. Um, I think I have I have one question, which I am sure is on a bunch of people's minds. Um, and first off, your enthusiasm is infectious, Marsha. So thank you so much. For that. <laughs> um, I was curious. Um, so if people are interested, it sounds like people can just go to the website, um, which I put a link in the chat to um, for the National Collaborative for Women's History sites and add their own sites to the Women's History Trail. Um, what about the process of working with Pomeroy to get the markers? Um, you just do oh, apply? Yes. Yeah, that, that's, it. that's really important. This is because your Connecticut State Co Coordinator is right here online. Joni, so we're trying to work through the state coordinators. Now, initially, we said each state could just have five markers, but now Pomeroy loves it so much, your state can have as many markers uh, as you can have the capacity to fill out the applications. So the process is, you select a site, you know, you talk to Joni, let her know uh, if this, you know, it sounds reasonable. And then you uh, fill out the paperwork. You have to, of course, give primary sources, it, all the things uh, the, on the form. Now you can go on the National Votes for Women's Trail uh, on the Collaborative website, and there's an entry form that shows you how to complete the entry form. And that's step one. And then when everything's, um, your information is gathered, you submit it. Oh, this is a really other good part I need to tell you about. First of all, we started this project, no money. I mean, no money. And so we thought, well, you know what? When women fought for the right to vote, they didn't have, didn't, no one was funding them. <laughs> so why do we think anyone's gonna fund us to do this? Well, then the Pomeroy Foundation came along, which was fabulous to give us the three markers. But that it, this is a lot of work, as you know, doing re historical research. It's you know, it takes sophisticated people and a lot of research. So fortunately, the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, which was a federal agency, that got five million dollars to celebrate the centennial. We got one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars from them to hire a project coordinator and four part four part-time historians. And if we did not have these historians to help us, we I don't know what we would have done. This was, but. Um, but now they've closed down and fortunately the Pomeroy Foundation has given us a little bit more money to fund our historians because it's, it's a lot of work. So our goal still is to have 250 um, roadside markers and that's why we need everyone to participate. So what the system is, you apply for the marker, you, it's, uh, the, it goes to our advisory committee. That's the other thing. We have a superb advisory committee of the leading suffrage scholars in America on this committee. And this group of people are so excited to be learning. I mean, these are the national experts and they've just learned so much. And then once they approve it, it goes to the Pomeroy Foundation and the Pomeroy Foundation has to approve it. So there's, oh, there's Paula Miller's own. She is <laughs> head of the uh, Pomeroy, but she's the superstar. Um, she's the one that approached us. So uh, then it goes to the Pomeroy Foundation. So we, we are very, and as the Pomeroy Foundation is committed that it is uh, everything historically accurate, but to get there, you know, it's a lot of work. And so then after that, then it's shipped off. So this process says, don't expect to get it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it takes a few months to get it approved then it takes time to get it ordered. And then uh, now we can't have, we haven't been having dedication ceremonies because of the coronavirus. But next year when it's gone, it's gonna, we're just gonna be having parties all across America. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, that was really helpful. Thank you so much. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that offers hopefully a good way of thinking about how, you know, the, the celebrations can extend too, is if, you know, yes. people apply for markers and then at some point down the road when we can, gather again, or at least safely gather outside, that that becomes another moment for potentially, you know, like bringing this stuff to the forefront of people's attentions again. So um, mm -hmm. thank you very much for that overview. I wanna hand things over to Joni for a little bit to give us a sense of what's been going on in the state of Connecticut. Joni? 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, just uh, to follow up a little bit more on the marker program, I wanted to give everybody an update on where Connecticut is at. And as Marcia said, um, we're extremely fortunate to that the National Collaborative was able to hire um, researchers because I've been working directly with one. I requested one very early on. Her name is Ann Fow, and she has been just wonderful to work with. And the approval of the approved markers that we have so far are um, Elsie Vervain, who is a machinist unionist down in uh, Bridgeport, uh, so working class. Um, she's representing a, a several of the union unionist women that went down and um, participated in the uh, National Women's Party uh, picketing. Emily Pearson, um, those of you who don't know, she was a strategist for the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, and she got membership from 300 members in 1910 to over 38,000 by 1917. I I mean, I would love to have her raising, you know, funds and getting members for me for my museum today. Um, the Hill Sisters, of course, down in Norwalk, they should certainly be um, acknowledged as well. So uh, they've made the, uh, the approval list. Um, uh, Seymour, Mary Townsend Seymour, who is an African-American woman um, from Hartford. She was a suffragist. She was also a founder of the Connecticut NAACP. So we've been working with Dr. Brittany Yancey on um, the marker for her. We are acknowledging Catherine Houghton Hepburn and Emily Pankhurst, Emily and Pankhurst at the same time, through a marker we're hoping that will be at Union Station. And that is demonstrating the transatlantic network that was happening all over the nation. Uh, but Connecticut bonded pretty well with uh, the WSPU, so we wanted to acknowledge that in some way. And then, of course, uh, we could not uh, forget Isabella Beecher Hooker, who was the founder, yes, Candies, <laughs> doing a little dance down there and she performs Isabella so hopefully when we have our marker dedication it'll be post-COVID and we'll be able to have candy uh, there maybe we'll do it virtually but um, I've been working with the Stowe Center as well and I've also been working with Litchfield Historical Society because I wanted something you know one of the things that we were considering is is diversity but not just of the individuals you know regions in the state as well uh, we didn't want everything to be Hartford centered so um, I worked with Litchfield and we ended up going with um, George A. Hickox, who was one of the um, constitutional members of the original members who signed the Constitution for the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association back in the 1800s. He also represents the 19th century, and his daughter was also very involved as well. He owned a newspaper that he, that he allowed to be the mouthpiece for the suffrage movement in that area of Connecticut. So we thought we would um, work on that as well. One of the things that Anne recommended I do right before the October 1st deadline for our first push of approvals um, occurred was she asked me specifically to write up um, information on how well Connecticut has been working together, um, the museum community. Some of you may not be aware of this um, because she has not seen the support in other states the way I have gotten support in Connecticut. We're working with the Cromwell Historical Society. I've got several members of the Connecticut Historical Society doing research for me. We're working with scholars like like Dr. Yancey and um, gosh, the Listfield Historical Society, the, the Harry Beecher Stowe House, um, everybody who is involved in these markers in some fashion have really just stepped up to help us discover the locations where Anne has been able to do the primary research from, from her, you know, where she's living because of COVID, of course. Um, and then whatever footwork needs to be done here in Connecticut has been handled. So I was able to write that up as well. I can tell you also, because I serve on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, that at both the Secretary of State and our Lieutenant Governor, Secretary Merrill and Lieutenant Governor Weisowitz, um, extremely excited about this program. They are also um, throwing their support behind it. They want to be um, participating in the dedications. I've been keeping their Chiefs of Staff updated on what's been going on and where we're at in the process. So um, the marker program is certainly really something monumental to be a part of. So if you have a um, person in mind in your community who was significant in Connecticut suffrage in some way. And by that, I mean, they can be living in Connecticut and be a national presence like the Hill Sisters, for example, or it can be somebody like Emily Pearson, who was primarily working in Connecticut. Uh, but, you know, something, someone of significance to the movement in some way, we would really love to be able to um, help you through that process of, of possibly obtaining a, a marker. 
I will say that you will have to cover the cost of the marker installation. And again, that, that you know, we can, we can work on funding for that um, as, we, as we get closer. But I'm gonna switch gears now and just talk a little bit about what is going on because a lot of organizations um, were, you know, really, you know, we, we had to, as we all know, put the stops on everything because of COVID. Um, and so a lot of the programs and events, I mean, I, I had countless speaking engagements that had to be canceled due to, due to COVID. Um, but what we have seen on a national level is women's history overall getting a level of attention that it has never had. Um, you know, not just the suffragists, but women in other fields and other backgrounds um, of women's history. So we're really looking at this as an opportunity to not only talk more about suffrage into 2021, but also women's history in general as a whole and try to really, as, as Amherst mentioned earlier, keep that momentum going. So I I did ask Amrys um, after the um, this webinar to send you all a bunch of links um, that you may find of use. If you're not familiar with the National Women's History Alliance, they are really taking the initiative into expanding into 2021. And they have a catalog, which is wonderful, of many different um, uh, things that you might be interested in, from books to uh, you know jewelry. But the back of their catalog is literally all of the states. And and their links to their um, uh, uh, suffrage centennial or their organizing um, uh, places. Like for example, in New York, it would be not only the New York Centennial Commission, but the Susan B. Anthony House in Rochester, New York. So places that also have other things going on and ways you can connect with them and find out what other events are still continuing into 2021, because of course, all of the marker installations will as well. And they also have a link on the very back page of their catalog that um, provides information on linking to the National Collaborative's marker database. So if you want to put information in there too, um, you can do that as well. Um, also, they have a, a gazette that they send out that they can send you copies of, and um, they have a speaker bureau, and their theme for 2021 has just been announced, and that's Valiant Women of the Vote Refusing to be Silenced. So um, we're really continuing this. We're hoping the, the word continues to spread and that um, we're just, you know, moving forward, you know, forward into light, as the suffragists would say, and um, just, you know, striking while the iron's hot and keeping all of this in the forefront front of everybody's mind is we you know really work to uncover uh, the hidden history of the women in all of our communities that that need more um, I think more interpretation as a whole. Great thank you so much Joni and I've popped a couple of links in the chat um, to uh, some of the material that you've been talking about and as Joni mentioned I can send a follow-up email to everybody with more information. Um, with that um, I can think I, can I say one more thing? Oh, go ahead Marcia. Uh, I've just got to publicly acknowledge uh, the Pomeroy Foundation because we would never have been where we are today. And Paula Miller, can you uh, can you say a couple words? I'm putting you on the spot. She's got. She's yeah. She's the executive director of the Pomeroy Foundation, who has made all this possible. So Paula, can you say a couple? Oh sure, Please do. sure. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we are um, delighted to be involved in this program and to partner with the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. And, um, you know, I popped on late, uh, unfortunately, so I really didn't hear your, your, your remarks, Marsha, but um, Marsha is so passionate and so enthusiastic that, you know, we just love, love, love working with Marsha and the National Advisory Committee. Um, you know, to fund these markers. I mean, the impact that we have seen that they make in their communities and um, it, the folks in, in their communities that didn't know that this history happened right here and being able to tell these untold stories um, that happened all over the country on the grass, grassroots level is just something that we're really, really proud and honored to be a part of. And congratulations, Joni, on you know, what you're doing in Connecticut. It, you know, that's really fantastic and, and uh, great advice for other folks. The local connection is so important to, you know, to help move through the process. And, you know, installation, I just wanted to say, you know, we've, um, you know, it, Many times um, your uh, highway department or department of transportation, 
you know, they will install them at no cost. So, and, and they want to install them many times. So, you know, hopefully, you know, you won't have to, to uh, raise funds for installation. In most cases, we found that, you know, th things will just be installed. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. So at any rate, um, thank you for doing this today and, and for Marsha, you know, everything that, that you're doing to keep this program moving forward. It's, it's our pleasure to, uh, to, uh, Keep going onward, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Paula. What a treat to have you with us today. Um, CLH is a big fan of the Pomeroy Foundation, um, and we we love having your support um, for our other events as well. Um, so it's great to continue that relationship. It's a nice surprise to have you here yeah. with us today. <laughs> Um, with that, I love to, um, you know, keep the conversation going um, and open things up to the group. If you have questions, you can raise your hand, you can pop a note in the chat and I can call on you. Um, I would invite you all to share, um, you know, experiences that uh, you have had at your own sites, um, ideas that you might have. I, I think I see this as an opportunity for um, those of us across the state who are interested in these issues to think about um, what can happen next, um, what we've done so far and what can happen next, perhaps make some connections um, among different sites. Um, I think this is one of the things that I've been trying to think about. You know, I think individual markers and individual women is one way of thinking about that history, but you know, what are some, what's the work that we can do to, um, to do more interpretation than you can do in the li very limited sort of exhibit label space of a marker um, to kind of flesh those stories out. Um, and make connections as the trail does, um, this idea of a trail um, among these different people. I think we've already seen some really fascinating uh, connections that give, that really demonstrate how um, the movement for women's suffrage is connected with all these other movements, movements um, around class and race and social justice and labor, um, you know, in the individuals who have already been mentioned that all of these things are related to one another at this moment during the progressive era. Um, it was a moment of great um, change and upheaval and, you know, in, involvement in the democratic process. Um, and I loved what you were saying, Marsha, about, um, about connecting this to um, the topic of voting issues right now, which is certainly something we are all thinking about every time we open up a newspaper these days. Um, so I'll just offer those as some framing ideas, but um, I'd love to hear from the group um, and from everyone who's here about um, if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you wanna share a little bit about what, uh, what's going on at your sites. Um, and Kathy Benowitz um, already has something to say. So come and share with us, Kathy, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thanks. That was quick. I just hit send. <laughs> now, um, a couple of things. You know, um, I've worked on uh, some exhibits with uh, with Norwalk and, and on Westport, and um, and I actually just uh, authored an article for the Connecticut History Review on one of the women that surfaced from that on Elise Gregory, who um, who becomes the first female editor of the Dial magazine. And I think what's really amazing is that these women um, who fought for suffrage really gained their um, their voice and their confidence through this process and went on to many, many greater things. Um, I think one of the, a uh, um, couple of the other uh, ways that I've been trying to contribute what I've learned that doesn't make it on the exhibit panels or labels, as you mentioned, is um, ConnecticutHistory.org has been very, very open to, um, to articles on some of these women that, um, that that we're discovering. Uh, Greg uh, is, you know, if you, you send him little abstracts of, of ideas, um, it is quite amazing how few women are represented in, on that site and their accomplishments. So I think that's a place that um, some of these stories can continue to be celebrated and living on. Um, and the other one is the American Biographical Dictionary of the Women's Suffrage Movement, which Tom Dublin, um, the, that is the editor, ends up Tom's from Connecticut. He grew up in Westport. Um, he um, was at Binghamton um, and he was, um, I, I, um, you know, he, he's been a, a scholar in this field and he's editing these biographies, which are online. He's looking for people to contribute and write up essays um and it's an ongoing project you know and, and and it's definitely not something that ends in 2020 so i can um i can send his contact information to to you maybe you can post it in in the chat um 
I'm, um, but I think that that's a really good way to, to keep doing that. Um, and I also want to say just a shout out to Joni because it's, it's great to have the Hill Sisters, um, you know, get those plaque kind of uh, as a final push in, in, the, in the Connecticut effort. And um, she's still working with the city of Norwalk uh, and a couple of people to get it, get it installed. But, um, but anyway, that's just a couple of things I wanted to pass on. Great, thanks, Kathy. That's wonderful. And I've popped um, Greg Mangan uh, at Connecticut Humanities information in the chat if you have story ideas you want to pitch to him for um, ConnecticutHistory.org, um, which is a great, a great way to kind of, um, if you're already doing research for an exhibit or something like that, you have something written up. Um, it's a wonderful way to get more eyes on that story and hopefully more traffic to your own sites um, because they always point out to resources at um, local collecting institutions. So those could be yours. I know that um, many organizations around the state have spent time over the course of 2020. Um, do you wanna, does anybody wanna share a little bit about um, what they've been doing at their own organizations or um, ideas that they have for the future? I know that a lot of things sort of changed because of COVID, but um, I know there've been exhibitions um, and other work going on. I would really welcome the opportunity to kind of, you know, celebrate the work that has happened already in the state. Amherst, may I go? Go for it, Melissa. Hi there, this is Melissa Josefiak. I'm the director of Essex Historical Society. And while we didn't have um, a number of important suffragists from our location, we banded together with our nearby towns of Chester and Deep River Historical Society to create an online video, basically. And what, instead of focusing just on the suffrage year, we did from suffrage on. And we're celebrating a hundred years of women's achievements in the Tritown area. And we reached out to the community outside of our collections. Um, and we asked, do you have a notable woman in your life to talk about from suffrage and then the so what, the then what, everything afterwards. So when we thought maybe we'd get a few dozen photos, we're at 250 and counting. So we've had to take, take our video concept and break it into three parts. So what launched this week is called Trailblazers in a New Century, and it goes from 1900 to 1950. And in a few more weeks, we'll take 1950 to 2000, and then from 2000 to 2020. And what we're seeing is that the women that have been nominated by their families or self-nominated or reached into their past about a, a relative or a friend that's gone by, um, the word that they use is humble that they are um, very humble to be included in this group of women that have been achieving so much. And we didn't want to do just um, doctors and lawyers and trailblazers themselves. We said, let's include uh, moms who raised families and did everything else, or women that were in the factories, or women that had part ownership in the factories, or women that ran um, a small shop. So what we're doing with this project, it's not just the one and done, we're also expanding our collections because as part of our marketing, we said this image, this story, whether it's a paragraph or a page now becomes the property of the historical societies. So we're actively collecting and expanding our collections so that um, now we have a story of women's history that has previously gone undocumented so that the history sites 20, 30, 50 years from now will say, thank you during the, um, the suffrage centennial for collecting the here and now, because that, that is going to inform our future. And so um, that first installment's up on our YouTube site, um, Essex History, uh, Essex Historical Society, as well as the Chester Historical Society's YouTube channel, and then also the website of Deep River Historical Society. So working as a group really expanded this project. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. If you have links to any of those handy, I'd love it if you could pop them in the chat so people can check out what you're talking about. That would be really fantastic. Great, sure, I will, thanks. Hi, uh, Michelle, I'm go ahead. Hi, I'm Michaela Pearson from the Old Lyme Historical Society. And we uh, had a lot of big plans, um, but uh, what we ended up doing because of the COVID restrictions uh, we have an exhibit at the Old Line Post Office, which uh, just is a very simple commemoration of suffrage. It's a large photograph, and um, 
and a, a write-up that goes along with it. And people have commented on it, you know, saying, oh, you know, it's so nice that you have that there. But um, we, you know, we would have loved to have had a larger exhibit in our building and all of that. So we do have plans going forward. Um, we're working on currently an application for Catherine Luddington, who was lived in Old Lyme and was a very prominent suffragist. Um, and she, uh, so we're working on an application for her for the uh, Connecticut uh, Women's Heritage, uh, you know, Hall of Fame, the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. And so finding out about these uh, trail markers is fabulous because it sounds like her house is right on Lime Street and uh, it sounds like it would be a prime spot. So thank you for this because it, uh, it's right in line with what we'd like to do, so. Thank you, Michaela. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name at first. That's okay. Thanks for that contribution. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious, Joni, can you speak to how um, this is connected? I know Connecticut has a, a women's heritage trail um, that, uh, is, isn't that correct? Um, it, it, they do, yes. We have, a, and it's also run by SHPO. We have a, yeah. a women's heritage trail. We have the Freedom Trail, which is okay. specifically African-American history. And then we also have um, a lesser known trail that's uh, related to the Rochambeau March. Um, I don't know too much about that, but military history, of course. <laughs> um, but this is not related to the, the heritage trail. Um, and I don't believe that either of the other trails actually have markers. One of the right. things that we did discover is that Connecticut does not have a formal marker program the way Kentucky does. Um, and, uh, you know, that's certainly something I think in the future we should as a history community ad address. Um, but uh, there, there are locations on the trail, and I certainly think that Catherine Luddington's home should be on that Women's Heritage Trail. Um, Marina, I, I not, I'm not going to pronounce her, her name right, but she's with the State Historic Preservation Office. She's also been working with me on this. Um, she oversees the, the Women's Heritage Trail and that application process. And then there's also the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, which uh, just this past year chose to inaugurate for 2020 only women that were involved in the suffrage movement that had not been previously previously uh, nominated and in, inducted. So um, they are also, uh, they also have an exhibit that uh, is a traveling exhibit too, and they have uh, speakers. Um, so you could probably have them do something virtual um, with, with a, a speaker for your program. Um, so there's certainly a lot of things in Connecticut that are, that are happening, but um, yeah, it's, it is very different from the, the Women's Heritage Site, which is not just suffrage. Great. Yeah. I just was wondering if there were any plans to kind of, you know, include, you know, make those two trails talk to each other. Um, it sounds like you're in conversation. So yeah, probably good. eventually because, you know, we work in the, we, work, we both work for SHPO, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, at the present moment, we're really just trying to get the markers established and then we'll go from there and see where the, the heritage trail wants to go. So great. Yeah. <laughs> Candy, go ahead. You've got your hand up. Yay. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for having this uh, meeting because for those of us who were so looking forward to embracing this celebration this year, we've been crushed at how much we haven't been able to do. So it's really great to hear that people are going to go forward. I love your idea of uh, Marsha of, of August this year to August next year, you know, expanding that. Um, I had many uh, just generic uh, suffragist programming that I offered as an independent and that all got canceled. And I was just really pleased that recently I got to be Isabella Beecher Hooker for the Stowe Center. And I wanna offer all organizations my portrayal of Isabella for any opportunity that you think would be would work for you. Because she, she launched the Connecticut uh, Women's Suffrage Association in 1869. So, and she also did a bunch of stuff. And her husband, John Hooker, who was a lawyer, uh, he actually, uh, we are classifying him as a suffragette. So uh, there's a lot of um, uh, material out there that can be shared regarding the work that she did, the presentation she did, who she talked to. And she was a pill, I will just say, she was a pill, um, but not only with the Beechers, but all through 
a lot of different connections with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and all these different people. So uh, she is Connecticut based and she is a Connecticut person, but her reach was farther than that. And there's so much material on these women that it would just be really great to be able to uh, touch on all different aspects of their lives. And I have done a lot of research for Isabella, but I would love to know if any of you have heard um, or experienced, because I get the question, other people who are portraying, I know that uh, Emma Palzio Ray is doing Victoria Woodhull, but is there, are, have you had or are you experiencing or know of anyone else out there who is portraying some of these people that we may not know about that we need to have on our roster and in our, in our uh, um, listing? Just so if I get the question, do you know of anybody who was, uh, we know the big names, but what about some of these uh, others that you may be familiar with that I am not and others that I work with aren't? Great, thank you, Candy. Um, if anyone has any intel on that, please feel free to um, raise your hand or pop it in the chat. Um, and uh, Candy, if you wanna pop your contact information in there in case anybody's interested in that portrayal, um, please feel free to do that. Beth. Hi, um, I'm here at, uh, in my role CLHO, but also with the Jewish Historical Society um, and following up on what Melissa was talking about, I think, uh, this is a good opportunity to think about um, women's history that might not have been, um, that might not be well known or that might be a focus of an exhibit or program that you could do even if it's not directly related to suffrage. Um, so in that vein, the Jewish Historical Society last year um, did an exhibit on um, a sort of trail that was actually called Trailblazers, Jewish Women in Connecticut. So pro just profiled, I think, 10 different women um, across the state. And um, uh, so A, that's just an example of a kind of thing you can do that, um, that may not take a huge amount of digging in your, in your local history of your local community of, of some interesting and prominent women. Um, and B, if anyone's interested, that exhibit is available for uh, traveling if, um, if there's an opportunity for that. Um, and thirdly, I just wanted to say, um, as, a, as a scholar of women's history, um, do people know where to find speakers? Do they know, like, if, if there are resources that we as CLHO could provide that would help to um, support programming that you might be interested in doing going forward, um, we'd be happy to pull uh, you know, some suggestions together. There are a few historians um, in the state who are available to speak about their research, there's other people that we could recommend. So, um, so let us know if that's something that would be helpful to you all. I do want to mention that um, the Connecticut Commission, Centennial Commission, did create a website where they started gathering that information together. But of course, it was, you know, overseen by the Secretary of State's office. And once COVID hit, they had to shift their focus, understandably. So um, certainly, if there's any way that CLHO, we can work together to, um, you know, kind of continue that, I think they'd really appreciate it. Rosemary, go ahead. Hi, I'm Rosemary Maranti from the uh, Playville Historical Society. We did have plans for both the presentation and an exhibit. Neither obviously took place, but we did replace it with two virtual exhibits that are still up on our website. Uh, the first one uh, takes, a, 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 they, they were my projects, but, um, looks at the, Connecticut, the, the history of the Connecticut uh, suffrage movement, but interspersed with it are the Plainville connections that we were able to dig up and really were able to dig up a lot more than we thought because we didn't really have a, a, an active uh, a, you know, chapter of the CWSA in Plainville, but there were a lot more connections than we realized. And then the second one takes uh, the position of women uh, in, in public office from 1920 to 2020. So they're still up on our website and we did get nice reception from the public on both of them. And, and I did have a quick question uh, for, for Joni. Will the state commission be looking at doing anything on the, um, the five women that were elected to the state legislature in, in 1920? 
Sorry, I was muted. Um, I believe they may already have. If you look at their website, they do have resources on women beyond um, the suffrage movement. So you might want to check there. Um, if there's anything further going on, I'm, I'm not sure. But I do know that um, Secretary Merrill was giving presentations, and I think she did a panel um, about women in office past uh, the right to vote. So right. yeah, great. Thank you. And I just quickly want to say, I don't think we have any sites in plain little that would um, qualify for the marker, but I definitely have some that I'll contribute in terms of the database of the trail. You know, certainly yeah. a location where Susan B. Anthony spoke, would that be appropriate? Yes. For, yes. For the, obviously, she spoke at hundreds of places, so it right. wouldn't qualify for a marker, but it would be nice to put it as a trail. So that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. We also have a note um, from Kira Holmes, um, just sharing a little bit about um, what they've been up to at the Wyndham Textile and History Museum, the Mill Museum in Willimantic. Um, they have an exhibit that's partially digitized titled Unlacing the Corset and Unleashing the Vote. Um, and I assume you can go to their website. Kira, if you have a link and want to pop that in um, so that people can check that out, that would be really great. Um, she's also involved with the Killingly Historical and Genealogical Society, and they're having a Zoom lecture tomorrow at 7 on suffrage. Um, and she has her email in the chat there. If you're interested in attending that, you can get the Zoom link. Kira, if there's anything more you want to say about those projects, um, I'd invite you to unmute yourself and say a little bit more if you're here with us still. Hi, guys. Uh, so my name is Kira Holmes, and I'm part of several different places. Excuse me, let me take that off. Um, I'm part of several different places. For Wyndham Textile and History Museum, the exhibit I was talking about, I'm actually one of the curators for it. And for, <clears throat> excuse me, for Killingly Historical and Genealogical Society, I'm kind of like interim executive director right now. We also have like a small women's suffrage exhibit up right now, but it's not digitized at all, unfortunately, because of COVID and everything. A lot of the volunteers really couldn't come in, so uh, it's, I love museums and I love women's suffrage and I'm just trying to help where I can and make connections, so thank you for every everyone here for all of your hard work. And thank you, Kira, for yours. It sounds like you're, you've you been doing a lot at a lot of different places um, and that's uh, that's a heavy lift a lot of the time, so, so thank you so much for that. Eliana, um, you want to share a little bit about what's been going on at uh, Lockwood Matthews? Hello, everyone. Um, unfortunately, my computer does not support video, so I apologize. Um, and you may hear a few squeals in the background. I am working from home and I have an eight month old daughter who's found her voice. So <laughs> apologies ahead of time. Um, so I'm the education program director at the Lockwood Matthews Mansion Museum. Um, I also like to thank CLHO for honoring us recently with, uh, with an award for our previous uh, exhibition on women's suffrage. Um, from Corsets to Suffrage, Victorian Women Trailblazers. It was on view in 2019. And it was, um, it closed actually just last year around this time. However, we were able to work with a local elementary school um, on the importance of voting and, you know, um, tied the history of the women's suffrage movement to the importance of voting rights today. Uh, it became a collaboration between uh, Tracy Elementary, they are a national blue ribbon school, and part of their mission is to work directly with the community and to, um, you know, assist with, you know, sort of, they're sort of activist um, items as well. So the entire program was going to be, um, you know, us coming in, they saw the exhibit, they learned about um, women's suffrage. We also tied it into the voting rights of the 1960s. And then today, how is it, you know, super important to vote? And they were going to create projects. Um, they were going to make sashes and buttons that said votes for women um, in English and in Spanish. They're a bilingual school. And then they were also going to take that a step further and create brochures um, and pass them along to the community about the importance of voting and why it's important to vote and to go out and vote because it's a huge election year. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to curtail some of these projects. They were also going to march in the Memorial Day Parade in Norwalk, Connecticut with the League of Women Voters, sharing their you know, projects, their signs and their posters. But again, a lot of this had to get curtailed because of COVID. But 
they were so passionate about the subject matter. And it was really, it's just important to, um, I know while we're talking about exhibits and being, um, sharing all of this with the public, we don't want to forget our youth and, um, you know, sharing programs or sharing this information with our youth um, is super important. And it's really resonating with them and what's happening today. Um, so just a little bit about what we did with with elementary school students and, um, you know, looking forward to seeing what's uh, going on with other institutions and their exhibitions this year. So thank you. Thanks, Ileana. Um, Beth Payne uh, from the Dudley Farm Museum um, offers a suggestion of checking your town for voting records. Um, she went and did a little research and uh, found a record in Guilford of the 734 women who registered to vote for the first time on October 1st, 1921. Um, so that's a really good tip if you're looking for, you know, names to follow up on or even just, you know, a wonderful story about, you know, about the franchise um, and you know what you know it, that that just I mean I love that Beth because it just evokes this moment where you're like you're signing up to do this really important civic thing for the first time I think that immediately kind of puts you in someone's shoes so that's really very powerful Beth do you want to share anything more about what you've been doing in Guilford you're still with us well thanks for that. Um, and Joni also mentions that um, the State Library has the minutes for the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, and these are now digitized. Um, so you might be able to find out more information about your town through those minutes as well. Um, if anyone else has other resources that they've been finding useful in this work, um, uh, please let me know. Kevin, do you have your hand up? Um, <clears throat> as a token male on this call, um, in Simsbury, uh, we have an interesting situation. We actually have a national suffragette, um, Mrs. Uh, Antoinette Eno Wood, and she's you know, contributed a lot of money to the national organization. But we also have a famous anti-suffragette, uh, Josephine Jewell Dodge. And she actually led some national organizations, uh, anti-suffrage. She also started the um, day school program. She was very big into nursery school. So that women could work. So it's kind of weird her um, her background, but we've actually had um, tours of our cemetery where, where where we actually have the two of them debating. Um, they're kind of fun. Uh, the other thing we're we're doing that didn't get done this year is um, Betsy McGuire. I hope many of you know Betsy McGuire. She's a brilliant playwright. Anyhow, she is writing a, a Women of Simsbury play for us, uh, which will actually take place in or out of the cemetery, but you know, highlight, we use the cemetery as a, as a backdrop for many of these pieces, you know, they're buried there and so they come up from the grave and talk to the people. Um, but that's another thing that we're doing is this, um, uh, this play. Um, but I was just wondering, you know, how do you handle the anti-suffrage women? Um, I think they're just as important because they have a message too. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if anyone has run into that because you know, Mrs. Woods definitely would qualify for a, for a plaque, I would think. I mean, she's mentioned it in the suffragist magazines and she started the, the first meeting of the Finsbury Equal Suffrage League was held in her house. Um, so, you know, we, and we have their minutes in, in the historical society, but I was just wondering if anyone else has dealt with an, a, a strong anti-suffragist woman. The, uh, so excited, I gotta it. jump in and say, thank you, Kevin, because that's really a, an important part of the story. So yes, cool. Okay. <laughs> Yes, so anti-suffrage story needs to be told as well, and they can be included on the National Votes for Women's Trail, and also okay. male uh, allies of women. You can add men, you can add anti-suffrage. We want the whole story. Good point. Well, that's that's yeah. what I, I believe. I mean, they deserve to be told too, um, you know, and why they thought that way. Um, so, so if I can jump in for a minute, Jamie Crumby, who um, until recently was at the Pequot Library uh, in Southport, she authored an article for the um, Connecticut Explored uh, Suffrage Issue on the anti-suffragist, and they were planning on doing an exhibit there. Um, I think that's been postponed to 2021. Um, but there are, um, I think, a number of people um, doing anti-suffrage work, and that would be an institution that I'd reach out to because I think they have a lot of material. I um, mean, even Beth might be able to comment more on that. Um, regarding, you know, Fairfield's um, tenor, um, but I just thought I'd mention that. 
Uh, sure, I can briefly um, uh, just be aware. Connecticut had a, a, a significant anti-suffrage women opposed to suffrage organization, as did many other northeastern states, especially. Um, and the most uh, sort of prominent woman in Fairfield at that time, uh, named Annie B. Jennings, was uh, was quite active in that. Um, so it's definitely a part of the story, and it's a part of the story that people who don't know a lot about the movement are, are surprised by because it seems strange from our vantage point that women would organize against their own rights. Um, um, I was brief, just briefly, largely a matter of um, uh, tended to be a matter of class privilege, but also there was a philosophy behind it that that these women felt that they had more more power um, outside of the political sphere, essentially. And it didn't mean that they thought that all women should stay home and, you know, be barefoot and pregnant. But um, so it is a very interesting part of the story, for sure. And you'll find it across Connecticut, I think. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, something that gets missed in this, and you know, we talk about the national election, but um, you know, Connecticut and Simsbury, you know, allowed women to vote earlier for that for things like school board, you know, things that were womanly, they could vote for. Um, and I, I think that message gets missed as well, um, that, you know, women could vote earlier, but it was only for things. And they actually had separate ballots. You know, they had a woman ballot and a male ballot. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I ever see that story told. That's great. I mean, that's that's a wonder. I mean, I can just imagine the, you know, the exhibit panel where you have those two artifacts there and can like, you know, create that conversation about, you know, about the path to com the complete franchise and what it looked like, because that was a really varied story across the country. I mean, there were states that had, you know, um, the franchise for women prior to 1920, right? Um, you know, as well as the sorts of things you're talking about, Kevin, in terms of, you know, being involved in things that were seen as more in women's, uh, in, in the woman's sphere as being a place in which women, it was okay to engage in the political sphere. So that's really, I, I really thank you for bringing those stories to our attention, because I think it really helps, you know, you know, this is really the question about interpretation, right? It's like, how do you transport people to this moment in time and not make it a story of like, the suffragists were right and everyone was opposed was bad. You know, that this is a complicated social conversation about how the future of the country is gonna work. Just like, you know, we're having those kinds of complicated social conversations right now. Um, and I think that really helps people connect um, to these moments in the past and make them, um, you know, all to, in all of their texture and nuance, um, make them really uh, come to life. So thank you for that. Um, this has been a really fascinating conversation and I'm sure that we could stay here all day um, talking women's history. Um, I wanna, you know, we're, we're a few minutes over time and I just wanna thank everyone for being here and being a part of this, for sharing uh, the resources that you have um, and for talking a bit more about what you've been up to. Hopefully you get some good connections out of this and I hope that there'll be a, a peppering of, of map pins on the uh, women's suffrage trail um, as a result of this. Um, but I also wanna extend a special thanks to Joni and to Marsha um, for being with us today um, and for giving us a little bit of the, the bigger picture and what's going on and how we can carry this work forward. Congratulations so thank you all for being Connecticut here. for all your fabulous work. <laughs> thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday. Bye -bye.